There is nothing more amazing and incomprehensible than the wickedness of sinners, especially those who have the Catholic faith. They know from what they have been taught from their earliest youth why they were created and why they are in this world. For someone who knows that he is here to serve God and observe his laws and commandments, it's hard to imagine how someone like that can commit sin, especially mortal sin. A Catholic knows how miserable he will be if he doesn't follow God's law. He knows that if he commits a mortal sin, it will put him in a a degrading slavery to the devil in this world and in the next world in the fires of hell. But unfortunately, a lot of Catholics continue to sin every day and have very little, if any, fear of what they are doing. And this is something very hard to understand. We know that if we commit mortal sin, we become worthy of the fires of hell, as our Lord has warned us repeatedly in the Gospels, not only through parables, but but by direct statements. But not only does God threaten sinners with hell, he also tries to convert them to bring them to repentance in this life before it's too late, but by punishing them even here with temporal punishments. God punishes people with sickness and misfortune to get them to think about their souls. But unfortunately, even then, a lot of people still don't renounce their sins and and their wickedness. But we have to remember that when God sends sufferings in this world, it is for that purpose. It is to punish people for sin in order to draw them to repentance. Especially because it it seems like the world is entering a time of serious punishment, maybe very soon. So we have to put ourselves into a proper Catholic mindset about all of these ideas. In order to get a sinner to repent and truly renounce his evil life, God usually uses his goodness first. He treats the sinner with mercy and patience. St. Paul says, Knowest thou not that the goodness of God leadeth thee to penance? And God does this in order to make the sinner say to himself, Look at how I have sinned, how I have rebelled against God, And at any moment, God could punish me, not just here in this world, but even in the next world, by sending me to hell. But instead, he has spared me and given me time to repent, even though I am his enemy. That is what God wants the the sinner to think, to to enter into himself and, and, and come to his senses. When he realizes that God has repaid him good for evil. But unfortunately, a lot of times people don't repent this way and they even use God's mercy as a means to sin against him even more. The more they are prosperous and healthy and content in in this world, unfortunately, the more they turn away from God and, and turn toward the pleasures of this life, which they use in order to sin. But then God uses another way to open their eyes, to bring them to repentance. He uses punishment. God visits the obstinate sinner with with terrible scourges. As it says in the Psalms, many are the scourges of the sinner. And we see this throughout history repeatedly. God punishes entire peoples with terrible punishments and catastrophes. He punishes them with wars and invasions and oppression of of the people with unjust rulers and pestilence and famine and economic collapse, ruined harvests and and other, other misfortunes. God wants to get people to pray to him for help in this world at first. But then also to think about God and to think about their sins and set their lives in order so that they will 
hope that God will forgive them here in this world and avert those calamities if they repent of their sins. That is what God wants people to think, and that is a, a correct way to think. It says in Ecclesiastes, death and bloodshed, strife and sword, oppressions, famines, and afflictions. All these things are created for the wicked. And we see this proof by countless examples in Scripture on almost every page. In Leviticus, God gave a solemn warning to the people of Israel. First, he promised them good things if they would do good. He said, if you walk in my precepts, I will give you rain in due season. The ground will bring forth its increase. You will eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land without fear. I will set my tabernacle in the midst of you, and my soul will not cast you off. That's what they can expect if they follow his laws. But then it goes on, But if you will not hear me, nor keep all my commandments, I will do the following to you. I will visit you quickly with poverty. You will sow your seed in vain. I will set my face against you and you will fall down before your enemies. And and you shall be subject to them that hate you. So this is already pretty, pretty serious what God is warning them. But God doesn't seem to expect that even that will be enough to convert them. And this, this warning goes on and it says, But if for all of this you will still not obey me, I will chastise you seven times more for your sins. I will make to you the heavens above as iron and the earth as brass. I will make you few in number, and I will make your highways desolate. So what a frightening threat this is. It is hard to imagine how the Jews could hear all of this and still turn away from God, but that is exactly what they did many times in Scripture. And... For us, that's exactly what we do all the time whenever we commit sin. All of this shows us how offensive it is to God when we sin. Something that we really don't grasp or understand very well and very often ignore. But if you open the end of the Bible to the book of Judges, you will see all these threats being fulfilled. God visited a terrible chastisement on the people of Israel. It says in Judges that that after the death of Joshua, they grew faint in the practice of their religion. They began to associate with the pagans, and that led them away from the laws of God, which is still a danger for us today, being influenced by the, the bad example of pagans all around us. And God tolerated this for a while. He showed mercy. He gave them time to repent. And they didn't. And so then he gave them into the power of the king of Syria. They were taken into captivity and they were kept in a terrible slavery in bondage for eight years. Until at last they turned to God in repentance and did penance for their sins. But this was not just one one time thing. They turned away from God many times, and every time they did so, God punished them severely. They lost all of their their peace in this world and they, they suffered oppression in all kinds of ways to the point where when they were invaded by the king of Syria, they had to flee their homes and hide in the mountains while their enemies destroyed all of their property and killed their livestock and destroyed their crops, as the Bible tells us in Judges. But God did all of this to punish these people for being unfaithful to Him. Or another, another time, we read in, in the days of Elias, God was offended by people's sins, and He closed the heavens for three and a half years, so that there wasn't a, a single drop of rain that fell on earth for that amount of time. We can just imagine what terrible sins the people must have been guilty of for God to do something like this. 
and so this resulted in a terrible famine. And then in the time of his disciple Eliseus, just a few years later, there was another famine that lasted seven years. And many people starved to death because God had made good on his thread where he said in Leviticus, in vain will you sow your seed. But unfortunately, a lot of people still refused to repent even under those terrible circumstances. And that is something that we have to be careful to avoid. Wicked people are still not afraid to offend God. And they still consider, even when they are, are being punished, still consider their wickedness to be just something that doesn't really matter or is not that important. They look at their, their swearing and impurity and drunkenness and stealing and injustice and, and all kinds of sins as things that are just a kind of a minor issue. But how can something be minor that brings about such terrible catastrophes and which have always brought such incredible evil and suffering into the world? We look around ourselves today at all the evils that are taking place in the world and we have to remember that all of these things are a punishment for our sins. Just as in the past, we shouldn't look at the misfortune as something that's just bad luck or the result of a, a mistake or of the, the bad will of, of evil people. On a human level, it, it is all of those things. But from God's perspective, nothing happens by chance. God is in charge of every event that happens in the world. Our Lord says not even a single sparrow falls to the ground without his knowing it. So if God's providence controls even such a small thing as a, as a little bird dying, certainly it is also in charge when we suffer in, in war or disease or famine or any other misfortune, which he uses, as he told us, to draw us from this world and from our sins in order that we will turn towards him and amend our lives. But as I said, a lot of people only become more obstinate in sin when God punishes them and we have to be careful not to commit that error. God's punishments are not only here in this world. If his punishments are not able to make us convert here, then he will send us for, to hell forever, and that is the worst possible punishment. And even in this world, he can withdraw his graces from us if we are obstinate, so that it becomes very difficult for us to repent. God mentions this in the book of Jeremiah. He threatens this too. He says, we, have, we would have cured Babylon, but she would not be healed. Let us forsake her. When God forsakes a sinner like this, that person becomes more and more blinded and hardened until he loses his faith and abandons religion and even begins to hate God. And his heart becomes filled with obstinacy and despair. But no matter how sinful we have been, if we have been ignoring God's punishments or looking at them only from a, a naturalistic or, or materialistic point of view, let us open our eyes at last and see what God is trying to teach us by suffering and misfortune. Let us come to him with true sorrow and repentance and a firm resolution to avoid sin in the future, not just so that it will avert our suffering in this world, but out of a sincere love of God as our Heavenly Father, whom we finally realize that we have offended disgracefully. We have to have love for God in order to be forgiven of our sins. But if we turn to Him in prayer, He will give us the, the true dispositions that we need in order to be sorry for our sins, and then He will change our hearts and forgive us.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.